Welcome to the GCN Racing News Show. This week, how fast do the pros go in training? Uh, we're used to seeing their exceptional speeds in races, but are they much faster than us outside of them? Uh, Tom Doolat is taking a break from the sport, so we'll give all the details on that. Plus, we've got the UCI Cyclocross World Cup from Overlazer, a chance for you to join Team Movistar, and the end of an era, as we'll no longer see Mavic neutral support cars at the Tour de France. <laughs> This week in the world of racing, we learned that Tom de Moulin is taking an unpaid and indefinite break from pro cycling. The news came as something of a shock, since he himself had announced his racing programme for this year less than 24 hours previously. More on that coming up later, but we also learned this week that Wout van Aert will remain with Jumbo Visma until at least the end of 2024. That announcement made by the team with a very clever video highlighting his versatility. Receptie met Wout. Room service. Ja, eetje Wout. Jij kan ook echt alles, hè? Jij mag blijven. Wat is dit nu voor een shot? Looks like he could do some filming and presenting for us actually, and maybe even topple Sai if he became the fifth member in five versus one. Uh, finally this week, we learnt that the pros might not ride quite as fast as you think when they're training. Now we all watch in awe as they cover 200 kilometers in a little over four hours in a race, but of course, when they're training on their own, they aren't anywhere near as quick. Now we'll get onto why in just a little while, but first, let's have a look at a few examples of pros training over the last week. First up, Chris Froome, who's still over in LA. Uh, he posted just one ride to Strava last week, albeit a big one, 184 kilometers with almost 5,000 meters of climbing, and judging by the title of his ride, Windy 2. Now it took him seven and a half hours, so an average speed of less than 25 kilometers per hour. I'm starting to feel better already. It is the definition of a shark's tooth profile though, very little in the way of flat there, and he set some reasonably good times on the climbs, even if he didn't threaten Phil the KOM King Gaiman. Uh, speaking of Froome, some interesting results from the poll we put up on the GSIN app last week. Almost two thirds of you don't think that Chris Froome will ever get back to his best, whilst 36% of you think that he will do at some point, even if it's not this year. We'll move on to Roman Bardet now, who last week did his first ride of the year of over 200 kilometers with his new DSM team. Uh, that distance included 4,000 meters of climbing and took just under seven hours. So an average speed of just over 30 kilometers per hour. But that was with a group of his teammates, as opposed to Froome, who looked to be riding solo. Froome's former teammate, Michal Kwiatkowski, is in Gran Canaria with some of his teammates. Uh, one of his rides last week was a 180 km lap of the island with 3,000 meters of climbing. Uh, he also averaged a shade over 30 km per hour for the six hours that it took them. Back to Team DSM, and Chad Hager is also on the camp in Alicante in Spain. Last Wednesday, he was with a group that did 132 kilometers in four hours and 22 minutes. So yet another ride with an average speed of 30.1 kilometers per hour. Although judging by the title, there was a 20 minute test within that. And judging by one of the segments, he averaged around 435 watts. I'm not feeling so good seeing that. Still, not as fast as you might expect. Meanwhile, Wout van Aert, as well as signing contract extensions, is also training with Jumbo Visma, who have based themselves near Alicante too. Uh, he did a pre-breakfast seven kilometer effort, but it took him over half an hour. So only averaged 13 and a half kilometers per hour. Although that was a run, not a ride. Uh, he's preparing for the Cyclocross World Championships after all. He has though also been doing some riding and on Wednesday he did 172 kilometers in five hours 36 with 3,700 meters of climbing at an average speed of just under 31 kilometers per hour. And he took four KOMs along the way. All of them, interestingly, were on descents. These pros aren't just powerful of course, but also very skillful, particularly in the case of Wout van Aert. So I tried to find a pro rider who'd averaged over 32 kilometers per hour or 20 miles per hour on a ride in training since January. That didn't come from Tour de France winner Tali Pogaccia. He has uploaded two rides to Strava since the start of the year, both of them from near his home in Monaco, and both with an average speed of under 29 kilometers per hour. 
What I should have done, of course, was gone straight to look at Annemiek van Fleurten's Strava page. On Saturday the 16th of January, she did 165 kilometers with the Mobistar men's team in a little over five hours. Average speed, 32 and a half kilometers per hour. Now this speed data from all of the riders doesn't really mean very much. We don't know what efforts were done within each ride. We don't know how much time was spent in the slipstream with others. It's winter, so more clothes are being worn. They're also not in peak condition, maybe not on the best equipment, but nevertheless, it does highlight the discrepancy between race speeds and training speeds. Now there are a lot of reasons for that discrepancy. The most obvious one being that it's a lot easier to ride fast in a peloton of 200 than it is on your own, or even in a small group. But there is a lot more to it than just that. Firstly, they're on closed roads, which means there's no stopping at junctions, causing you to lose all your momentum. And then beyond that, the recent scientific study by Bert Blocken highlights the biggest reason that they can ride so fast in races. Slipstreaming, not just behind other riders, but behind vehicles. Now we all well know the benefits of being sheltered from the wind, but I don't think we realize just how much those benefits were. So riding 10 meters behind a single motorbike, you get a 23% advantage. Now when you consider that the lead rider from a breakaway or peloton is less than 10 meters behind a camera moto, and that there are a large number of other motorbikes and cars in front of that, you start to realize that the wind they are having to push out of the way in order to propel themselves forward is a huge amount less than they or we have to do when we're out training on the road. So, next time you're out on your bike, hitting 40 kilometers per hour during a short effort and wondering how the hell these pro riders average that speed or more for hours on end, you can rest assured that it is literally because it's far easier for them to do that in racing than it is in training. Yes, they are supremely gifted. Yes, they are the best of the best in the world, but they do have a little helping hand. And I can tell you through personal experience that it makes an enormous difference. Sitting in a bunch at 40 kilometers per hour on a flat road is not actually that hard. In fact, it's ridiculously easy. So there you go, just trying to make us all feel a little bit better about ourselves on a Monday morning in January when we all need a bit of positivity. So let me now bring you back down to earth with a bang with the news of more early season races being postponed. Both the Vuelta al Algarve and the Ruta del Sol, or Vuelta Andalusia, were supposed to take place in February, but both have been pushed back to May in light of the COVID-19 situation in Portugal and that area of Spain. Bad news for us as fans, of course, but I think we can all take positives from the way in which pro cycling organized a revised season last year. So they've proven they can do it, and so even if races don't take place when originally scheduled, I remain very optimistic that we will still end up with a very near complete season by the end of this year. Or maybe I'm being naive. Either way, those aforementioned postponements of races in Europe could well make an already stellar lineup at the UAE Tour even better. So last week, they announced some of the big names already confirmed to take part, including last year's winner Adam Yates, who is now, of course, with Ineos Grenadiers. Uh, his new teammate, Filippo Ganna, will be there for the first time. And Ganna's former teammate, Chris Froome, will also be there for the Israel Startup Nation. And in fact, it will be his first race for that team. Also there will be the winner of the second ascent of the Jebel Hafid last year, Tadej Pugacar, and his team, UAE Team Emirates, as you'd expect, I guess, are sending a very strong lineup to their home race, including new recruit Mark Hirschi. There are sprinters aplenty too, with Caleb Ewan, Sam Bennett, Fernando Gaviria, and Pascal Ackerman amongst those, plus, of course, Mathieu van der Poel, who we already mentioned in a show a couple of weeks ago. Now, I don't know about you, but I just cannot wait for the road season to begin now. That said, I'm still very much enjoying the cyclocross races, of which we had two over the weekend. So here's Jeremy with a roundup of the action. Thank you so much, Dan. Actually, I've got a big surprise. I was able to ask my friend and who I co-commentate with on the weekends, my good friend, Marty McDonald, to join me for the racing news show today. Marty, thanks for coming over. We're gonna be able to recap this weekend's racing and it was awesome. Next to a bird comers trophy on Saturday and going into it, Lucinda Brand, who hasn't been off the podium so far this season, was leading Denise Betzema by 58 seconds. And Betzema doing that tactic that she always does, did she? Going off the start like a, like a rocket ship. And uh, But Lucinda Brand managed to get through at the end of the first lap take the intermediate sprint, but was kind of fiddling with her shoe as she crossed the line. And then into lap two, there was a crash by Betsima, there was a crash by uh, Lucinda Brown, and that was the opportunity for Celine Del Carmen Alvarado to get away, and she never looked back. 
No, she really didn't. She was riding like she was uh, shot out of a cannon, as I said on the commentary. She was absolutely flying. She rode really perfection as she went through the entire course. It was a different course than we've seen in years past in Hama. It was much muddier, much, much slicker. It was a really fast course. It had the beautiful BMX type section with lots of berms. It's a really, really beautiful race. But uh, leading into the World Championships, Alvarado put down a big stamp in Hama and took that victory. When we look at the men's race, and I'm sure you'll agree, we're starting to get treated to these big battles again between Wout Van Aert and Matthew Van Der Poel. And it just seems to be swinging one way and then the other way. And on Saturday, it went the way of Matthew Van Der Poel. Yeah, I mean, fifth consecutive win in Hama. If there's a course that's suited for him, then this is the one. It's got all of those crazy burbs. It's got all those technical bits. But Wout Van Aert was riding super, super strong and kept the pressure on all day. In fact, in the finish line shot, he was right there. He didn't want to be out of the finish line shot. He wanted Matthew Van Der Poel to know that he was lurking in the background. Some of the times when he was coming around those big sweeping turns, Marty, in the mud, you could just see Dendermonda all over again. The power that Wout Van Aert is able able to put through his lower legs, his back. He's so, so strong and complete as a rider. He really is a beast out there. It wasn't the perfect course for him today in Hama, but he really did show his strength as he gets round, wound up for the World Championships. Then, of course, we moved to Overice on Sunday. And if, and if you're not aware, one of the most important parts of the history of Overice is it's where left beer comes from. That's right. I mean, who doesn't laugh? Uh, love a Leffa Brun? And that's my favorite. I don't know if you're a blonde guy, Brun guy, double. There's all kinds of Leffa out there. But if you don't know, it is one of the most delicious beers in all of Belgium. Of course, that's going to be heavily debated down in the comments, which I'm fine with. But it is one of my personal favorites. And the course was on point and it did not disappoint. It was an absolute classic. In the women's race, Celine Del Carmen Alvarado has got to go into the world with massive confidence. She absolutely smashed it. Her descending ability this season is something to behold. And, and Lucinda Brand taking that World Cup overall. But again, another, another real standout ride for both Manon Baca and Clara Honsinger. Yeah, it really was. As you said, Alvarado in that opening lap, Marty, she flew down that descent, opening up so many bike lengths straight away. Braun, very strong on all of the riding and climbing sections, so her power output was there, but technically not able to match. But like you said, Manon Backer rode an incredible day, ended up finishing again on the podium, following up that third place in Hama, again, able to literally just holding her face as she came across the finish line at the World Cup in Overice. I couldn't believe it. And then, of course, Clara Hansinger rode super strong to finish it off with fourth place. So big rides from everybody on the women's side today. Yeah, and going into the world, you've got to look as well. Anna Kay, Evie Richards, Marion Avos, Blanca Katavas, they're all, um, you know, moving up in terms of uh, the form stakes. But the men's race, I think one that's going to go down in history. Yeah, oh my gosh, what a race that we saw. All of the big champions without any real issues coming into it, although we did see a little bit of bad luck from Matthew Vanderpool in a flat tire, but Wout Van Aert shot out like a force. He was so focused at the start, wasn't he, Marty? He was. It's like a force of nature, you would say, Wout Van Aert on that ride. But I think it's not something that you get to see very often, and, it, and it's Wout Van Aert and Matthew Vanderpool at their absolute limit and you could see how you know at different the way it swung backwards and forwards throughout the race what you know one time it's advantage Wout Van Aert Matthew Van Der Poel got back to within five seconds and you could see the posture of Wout Van Aert changing completely and Van Der Poel got close but just couldn't get close enough and that's the beauty of cross isn't it it really is. It really is. Pitcock was also there with third place with Michael Van Torenhout. He was riding very, very strongly, but not even really in the picture. It was really the two kings, Matthew Vanderpool and Wout Van Aert, that went back and forth. Vanderpool really did put Wout Van Aert under pressure. Van Aert at one point literally faced bright red, just slobbering. He was going as deep as he could. And like I said many times, Marty, their legacy and their uh, their uh, desire to win this upcoming World Championships, it started today in uh, Overijse. And the mind games they're going to be going on all week in the press uh, over in belgium they are indeed and uh, you know it sets it up beautifully for that one i can't wait yeah well that's what we've got for you from this weekend cyclocross racing thank you so much we'll see you next weekend for the world championships back over to you dan thanks very much jeremy and to marty this week i'm very much looking forward to the world championships this weekend that is definitely one not to miss 
However, we do also have our first road race of the season live on Race Pass this coming Sunday. It's the Grand Prix Marseillaise, which has never been shown live before. Uh, we have it all available on Race Pass in all territories, and you'll be able to watch the likes of Philippe Gilbert, Matteo Trentin, Brian Cocard, John Dadenko, and Tim Wellens begin their seasons. Won't it be fantastic to see the peloton rolling along again? We have, though, already had some racing featuring World Tour riders in Australia at the Santos Festival of Cycling, which has kind of replaced the Tour Down Under for this year. And it almost brought a sense of normality to see Richie Port winning on Wollonga Hill with a roadside packed full of fans not wearing face masks. Australia in a very good situation, of course, regarding coronavirus at the moment. So much so that they can live almost completely normal lives. Hashtag jealous. Port's ride that day, though, wasn't enough to see him win the event overall because an incredible 80km solo attack on day one by Luke Durbridge saw him build an almost unassailable lead in the GC, which he saw through to the end of the four-day race. Sarah Giganti dominated the women's race, meanwhile, taking stage two by almost two minutes and stage three to Wollonga by a minute. I cannot wait to see her racing the biggest European races. What a talent she is. Now, at the start of the show, I said that you have a chance of joining Team Mobistar. So, coming up are all the details that you need to know. So, it's called the Mobistar Team Challenge, and it's a talent ID scheme that will ultimately find five men and five women to join the new Mobistar E Team. The competition is going to be held on Zwift, and we at GCN will be following proceedings every step of the way. 300 of the top performing Zwifters have already been selected, but you have the opportunity to add yourself to that list. So, if you are a talented indoor cyclist, you will want to know how to get involved in this project. Well, it all starts on February the 3rd, so a week on Wednesday, with qualifying races. In total, there will be four, two for men and two for women, held at different times of the day, and the top three from each will join the 300 pre-selected riders in round one, which is on Wednesday the February the 10th. Uh, that week, there will be two elimination races with the best 50 women and the best 50 men heading on to round two, which will whittle things down to 40 riders total who will take on the final. That final will consist of a number of different challenges and ultimately the performance staff at Team Mobistar will select their 10 rider roster. Entrance must be 18 by March the 21st this year. Uh, if this is for you, you can find all the details on how to enter in the description just below this video. Good luck. I'll be watching this with great interest, I've got to say. Let's move back now to Jumbo Visma, who last week revealed their Tour de France lineup for this season. Not quite as early as they did for last year, but still far in advance of any other team. That lineup is Primoz Roglic, Steven Kreisweich, Sepp Kuss, Wout van Aert, Mike Turnison, Robert Hessink, Tony Martin, and Tom de Moulin. Except that less than 24 hours after that big reveal, de Moulin's participation became very unlikely after he revealed that he's taking an unpaid break from the sport for an undetermined period of time. Here's what he had to say in a video statement supplied by Jumbo Visma. Yeah, yeah, kijk, een aantal jaar geleden heb ik hele mooie resultaten gehaald en ben ik voor eens en voor altijd Tom Dumoulin, de grote Nederlandse wielrenner geworden. En inderdaad, daar, daar, horen, um, daar hebben mensen heel veel verwachtingen bij. Uh, wat ik zeg, uh, mensen thuis, uh, de ploeg, uh, ikzelf. En ik, ik was gewoon gewend om alleen met mijn eigen verwachtingen... Ik bedoel, als topsporter zijn je eigen verwachtingen al heel moeilijk om, om, om te managen, zeg maar. Ik bedoel, je wil zelf al heel graag en dat kost soms al veel stress. Maar als er ook nog allerlei andere mensen wat willen... Um, ja, dan kun je heel makkelijk zeggen van, joh, leg het naast je neer, wat hebben zij ermee te maken? En um, ja, dat is, dat is makkelijk gezegd, maar uiteindelijk vind ik dat toch moeilijker dan, uh, dan ik had verwacht. En uh, ja, dat, dat borrelt nu al te lang. En uh, het wordt tijd dat ik daar gewoon uh, voor mezelf uh, duidelijkheid in krijg van hoe. Misschien wil ik nog wel wielrenner zijn, maar inderdaad, dan, dan is het wel belangrijk dat ik... Dat ik me veel minder ga aantrekken van wat andere mensen daarvan vinden en dat ik veel meer mijn eigen plan trek. Um, dus uh, ja, daar ga ik tijd voor nemen. Ja, het voelt goed. Het voelt echt heel goed. Het is echt alsof er een, uh, een rugzak uh, van 100 kilo uh, af is gegaan. En ik, ben, uh, ik werd meteen helemaal vrolijk wakker van ja, dit is, het voelt gewoon zo goed dat ik eindelijk een besluit heb genomen van ik ga echt even de tijd nemen voor mezelf. En dat, uh, ja, dat, dat zegt genoeg denk ik. 
a weight off his shoulders. Now, I think my reaction to reading the news was probably the same as yours, shock and disappointment. Perhaps I shouldn't have been as shocked as I was. I mean, he's already had a couple of very hard years with injuries, illness and other setbacks. But the disappointment remains because I love watching him race and I particularly love the insightful interviews he gives around that racing. However, this is clearly a decision that's right for him. And for that reason, we can only support that decision and hope that it is the first step to becoming happy again. Yes, he's well paid. Yes, he's doing what many of us would love to be doing. But let's not forget that this is a very, very hard sport with an ever increasing amount of pressure. And his move is not an unprecedented one, of course. Uh, Leonard Kamner took a break from the sport back in 2018 at a very young age. But more high profile than that was Marcel Kittel, who took a break and ultimately retired from the sport at just 31. Now, he was one of the first people to offer public support to the Moulin on his Instagram account, as you would expect. And we too wish you all the best, Tom. We hope we're able to watch you again soon. But first and foremost, we hope you find the answers that you're currently searching for. Now, another man who will be taking a break from competing permanently, actually, at the end of this year is Alejandro Valverde. He will be at the ripe old age of 41 when he finally hangs up his racing wheels. Uh, the Spaniard has had a long, successful and sometimes controversial career, racking up 127 wins, including four at Liège-Bastogne-Liège and a whopping five at La Flèche Wallonne. Meanwhile, Elia Viviani of Team Cofidis will take what will hopefully be a short enforced break from training and racing. Uh, the Italian felt some heart arrhythmia on a training ride near his home in Italy and quickly went to get that checked out in Imola. A few days later, and he'd already had surgery at a hospital in Ancona, a right atrial ablation. Now, the good news is that the surgery appears to have been successful, so he's going to take a couple of weeks off the bike before resuming training. And he's still, in fact, hoping to start racing this year at the UAE Tour at the end of February. Moving on, and it's the end of an era, as Mavic will no longer be present at the Tour de France with their iconic yellow neutral service cars, as they have done since 1977. Uh, no reason was given for that decision, but it's no secret that Mavic have had financial difficulties over the last couple of years. So instead, Shimano will become the official neutral service supplier, as they have been at a lot of other high profile races for many, many years. Right, we are going to finish with the news that you've all been waiting for. Canyon SRAM have revealed their new kit for 2021. Here it is. Bloody nice that, isn't it? Uh, every year, it's just a subtle change, but every year it looks even better. So hats off to whoever their designer is. As ever, there is a poll over on the GSIN app. Hot or not, you decide. And maybe it'll take over the hot spot from SD Works. We shall find out very soon. Right, that is all for this week's racing news show. A lot to talk about, considering the road season hasn't even properly started yet. Uh, next week, though, it will have started, and I cannot wait. See you then.